First off, welcome to the Fall 09 Boardroom Insights Edition. Uh, thank you for coming, especially for those of you that are not even a member of the class. First off, if you turn off all electronic devices, I know we have a Sprint representative here, and this is, that's his uh, company, but uh, we'd like it to be quiet. Oh, I, should, I guess I should shut my cell phone off, too. This is my cell phone. Okay. What? You don't think that when I was in school we had cell phones too? They're just a little larger, that's all. Maybe Mr. Hesse can help me upgrade. Anyway, let's make sure, for those of you that are in the class, make sure you fill out the attendance card. Now, we, we, we had such a good response today that the attendance cards, some of them are blank, so make sure if you have a blank card, put your name on it, sign it, and then we want you to, at the end of this, of this presentation, write down what you thought was the most relevant comment that you heard. And we want to get that information back. So kind of like a mini survey. Uh, for Dr. Sexton students, make sure you write Dr. Sexton's name on the front of the card someplace. We're going to get those back to him so that you get credit for, for attendance as well. Uh, this is obviously today's presentation set up. And then... The next one is two weeks away. Now, not next Friday, but two weeks away when we bring in the Target CEO. Now, I'd like to introduce, uh, make a few words about Mr. Hesse, but he's such an extraordinary gentleman that I had to make some notes here so I didn't miss anything. First off, as all of you know, he's the CEO of Sprint Nextel right now. Previous appointments, Chairman and CEO of Embark, Chairman, President, and CEO of Terabeam. President and CEO of AT&T Wireless. President and CEO of AT&T Network Systems International. He's been named the Wireless Industry Person of the Year by the RCR Magazine, Executive of the Year by the Wireless Business and Technology Magazine, Most Influential Person in Mobile Technology by Laptop. He received the Wireless Magazine's Leadership Award. He's also a recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor and serves on the board of National Governors of Boys and Girls Clubs of America. He's earned an MS Master of Science degree from MIT, an MBA from Cornell, and most importantly, a Bachelor of, Business, a Bachelor of Arts excuse me, with honors from the University of Notre Dame. Now, I want to show you a little something about his history at Notre Dame. Okay, we'll see what your picture looks like when you guys come back, okay? <laughs> Anyway, uh, this is probably the most important part of his life. And when we talked about Mr. Hesse coming and, and having a talk here, uh, he wanted us to remind you of how, what Notre Dame is going to mean to you as you go through your lives. And he actually wrote in the Notre Dame alumni book an article about him and his roommates. And I want to read you this, just an excerpt from this article. In the fall of 92, Dan was living in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He got a call informing him that Tom, one of his ND roommates, was dying from a brain tumor, and that perhaps he had days to live, and his final wish was to be with his Notre Dame roommates again. He dropped everything and flew to Los Angeles, first of three roommates traveling back to see Tom. When he arrived, he was on the porch, and they spent the next hour and a half catching, catching up and reliving their end day experience. A few hours later, too late to visit her sick roommate, the other, th the other roommates arrived, and the three of them talked into the night. They were looking forward to watching the ND Stanford football game the next day with Tom. Unfortunately, they got a call. That evening, Tom had gone into a coma and was in the hospital. The three of them watched the game together, waiting for word about Tom. Around dinner time, they got the call. They went to the hospital. Unfortunately, Tom was unconscious and probably could not hear or understand them, but they were there. Cleet and Fred, the other two roommates, stood there stunned in silence and sorrow, and Dan started talking. Tom didn't move a muscle. Then Dad told Tom that Endy had lost the game to Stanford, and Tom's leg twitched. Okay. It made them know that what they did was worthwhile, that he heard them. It's some, it's, it says something about what kind of place Notre Dame is, that Tom's final special wish was seeing his roommates again, and that his roommates would travel so far just to spend time with him again. With that... That's for Mr. Dan Hesse to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. These embarrassing photos, they last forever. Um, well, thanks, uh, thanks for the very, very kind introduction. It's great to be back here at ND. It's kind of interesting being here up at the front of the room instead of sitting there on a day like this. I hate to say I'd probably be out there uh, when I was a student. Um, and I'll talk about kind of the, the, the new six-pack and, and how that might, uh, might change your life uh, a little later. But uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, enjoy your Notre Dame experience. It's, it's really a special one. You know, Notre Dame has a very special brand uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about brand, and particularly with respect to Sprint. I was brought in, um, you know, I had forgotten how many places I had worked. I tend to think I was, I'm not a job hopper, but a lot of those things had been at AT&T. I spent 23 years at AT&T, and my last three years there, I was uh, CEO at, uh, at AT&T Wireless. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you really grew up building and, quite frankly, genuflecting in front of what we called the Death Star back then, which was the AT&T logo the way it existed, uh, you know, uh, back then. And I was brought into Sprint about a year and a half ago because the brand was damaged, the company was damaged. The company had uh, let customer service slide in 2006, 2007. And when you do that, and you do it in a big way, it takes a lot of work to start to, 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 to bring it back. Um, customers uh, have long memories, and, it, and, and, and that takes some time. Notre Dame is one of those great brands, and it's a, it's a great uh, example to use to compare because not only is it a tremendous brand, it has very clear kind of images associated with it. Think of Catholic, you think of great academics, think of football, sports, um, tradition. Uh, a lot go with the Notre Dame brand, and the university works very, very hard, as they should, to protect it. Uh, I remember years ago, and he was a great football coach in great many ways, so this is not a reflection on him, but when Lou Holtz, they kind of had that... Um, it's kind of that violation around some boosters. That, you know, that for most universities, if it, you, know, you wouldn't even give a second thought to. But when something like that happens at Notre Dame, that's a big deal. Actually, even just quite frankly, the last two years, the football team not winning the way they normally do, uh, that is taken very seriously at Notre Dame uh, because of that great tradition. And the alumni and NBC, and, and lots of folks out there that look at that Notre Dame brand will give Notre Dame time because of all the years of goodwill that's, that have been built up, but you're only given so much time to, to, to get things back on track. So I feel kind of an affinity there. So as CEO, you are the lead brand person. You're the person that needs to think about the brand. And what the brand is, it's, it's everything that company stands for. Just like when you see that ND, it's everything the university stands for. It's not just the football team, okay? It's not just academics. It's the values you learn. It's all sorts of things. Everything is capsulated in that one logo. So don't think of brand as just advertising and logo, but it's everything a company stands for. And very often as the CEO or leader of the, the brand, we'll call it, uh, you need to take an unusual position, particularly when it's been damaged, to stand out there in front of the world and say we're going to be a new company, we're going to repair some things that, uh, that have been wrong in the past. So I'm going to show something quickly that some of you may have seen. the way wireless companies did things, what would you do? I'm Dan Hesse, the new CEO of Sprint. Here's our idea. Use your phone for all the great things it can do without worrying about the meter running. How's that for a wireless revolution? Pretty awesome, huh? Can you believe we still call these phones, considering all they can do? Truth is, technology is only great when you know how to use it. I'm Dan Hesse, CEO of Sprint. First, we revolutionized wireless plans. Now we want to help you get the most from these amazing devices. So come by a Sprint store for a personalized setup. You'll walk out an expert. So what you saw there were a couple of fairly big ideas in the industry that you want to show their big ideas and they're important by having the CEO project. Uh, and, those, and those two ideas were um, simply everything, which we were the first to kind of include everything that you, the phone can do in one rate plan. So for $100 a month, knock yourself out. 
unlimited data, unlimited text, uh, and I'll kind of show what that is a little bit later, as well as being the first to um, individualize a phone at the store experience with a customer. These new phones, these Swiss Army knives, they do all sorts of things, and, what, and it's quite frankly intimidating to a lot of people. So how are you going to improve customer satisfaction and change the way the retail experience operates in a world of much more complexity when it's not more than just, or not just dialing 10 digits. So when you look at the brand pillars, there are really five of them. When I talk about the major things about, major things you need to think about when you build a great brand, I'm only gonna talk about three of them because we only have so much time. So the first you saw an example of here, which is your brand message and your execution. You want a brand message, first of all, it's gotta be relevant it's got to matter, it's got to be clear, you've got to try to communicate it fairly simply, it's also got to be consistent with what you're also doing. Um, and of course the spokesperson matters with respect to what it is you're trying to accomplish. Humor is very important in certain brand campaigns based upon what it is you're trying to communicate. Uh, spokespeople tend to be used, whether it's an actor, somebody that's known, or a consistent icon over a period of time, because when you, what's very important is measuring the effectiveness of, of brand advertising. It's a science. A lot of you are taking marketing courses. Uh, there are many, many ways you measure. The most important things are probably brand recall and message recall. So companies that have had the same spokesperson or the same message or the same look and feel over a long period of time begin to build up, if you will, um, currency in the brand bank in terms of message recall which is very important. Uh, good example in terms of ads that are great and very memorable but don't necessarily sell products are what you send, tend to see for a lot of Super Bowl ads. Super Bowl ads, very often, very funny. You know, the ad itself was entertaining. And you remember this hysterical ad, but you know it was a beer ad, but you don't remember, was it Coors? Was it Miller? Was it Bud? So that's not really gonna move the needle in terms of really effective advertising. It's gotta be something that that sells product, because when people think of that ad, they remember what it is. So that's, uh, that's one. And I'm gonna come back to this, because that's an important element of repairing a brand. Is your brand message uh, resonating? And we had, we had an issue when I took over Sprint as well. It wasn't just the service issues. It was what was our message? What did we stand for? Who were we, and were we communicating that clearly? When you ask somebody why Sprint, an employee as well as a customer, could they answer the question? Uh, the second, and I'm probably going to need to put my glasses on. They have these little teeny monitors down here so I can tell what's on here. But the funny thing happens to you when you turn 50. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick these guys on. I can, I can see it up there. Um, the, uh, the second is the customer experience. Uh, and in our case, and lots of other companies, this is probably the best opportunity you have to repair or change the brand. You have thousands and thousands of customer experiences with your product every single day. Uh, in our case, we have 49 million customers. We're the third largest wireless company in, in, in the US. A lot, you know, we're having fewer and fewer customers contact us all the time because we're trying to reduce the reasons customers have to call us. We recently did a, a major brand study and a major attitude study uh, about the company not only from thought leaders, but customers and non-customers. What do you think of the Sprint brand? And the company that did it for us said they've never seen anything like it where you saw this enormous bifurcation, where you had this group of people that love Sprint um, and this group of people that thought very poorly of Sprint. And what it was was anybody who had had a customer service experience in the last 12 months, who had called customer care or been in a Sprint store in the past 12 months, whether they were a customer or a non-customer, had a very, very positive view of the company. Those that did not, did not. And there was this huge barbell. The good news, they said, is keep doing what you're doing because with each successive month, because see, right now it's everybody who's had an experience in the last 12 months. A month from now, it's everybody who's had an experience in the last 13 months. Two months from now, it's people who've had experience in the last 14 since we've got a lot of these things fixed. The downside, though, is that first group, the people that have had those experiences, if you look at the entire marketplace, is much smaller than the people who haven't. So how do you communicate with that large group over there who haven't? Which in a nutshell is, when you think about it from a business point of view, is Sprint's major issue. When you get to, I'll get to the other one, which is business performance. 
The good news is that we're generating a lot of cash. We weren't before. We're paying down debt. We're strengthening the balance sheet. When I got on board for the first six months, particularly with business customers, because business customers uh, pay a lot more t attention to the, the bond rating, the financial strength of the company than consumers generally do. And we've now generated enough cash, put enough cash in the bank where we can pay off all our debt maturities getting into 2012, which to have that kind of liquidity in today's world is actually fairly unusual. So we've kind of put that to bed. But the issue we have in terms of business performance is being able to grow subscribers. And the problem we have is, getting back to the earlier comment, the non-customers. So this past quarter, Sprint lost fewer customers, fewer Sprint customers, less Sprint, than in any quarter in the company's history. In this past quarter, we had more improvement in churn. Churn is the word that's used for people that, that, you know, that leave of any of the, the major carriers in the US. In 2008, we had more churn improvement, not only in terms of a percentage of the customers that leave us, as, as well as the absolute number of customers that leave us in a year. In 2008, we were the only one that actually reduced churn of all the major US wireless carriers. But why are we losing customers? Because for most wireless carriers, they have customers that leave them every quarter, existing customers that leave for whatever reason. But then they also bring new ones in. And they're bringing more in than are leaving, so net, net, they're growing customers. And the issue we've had for Sprint is because the, once the brand gets damaged, it's much higher to acquire non-customers who haven't had an experience with you. So the, all of the progress we're making in satisfying our customers more, making them happier, giving them great service, is being eaten away by each quarter, fewer and fewer new customers come to a Sprint store to look at Sprint. So net, net, you're losing customers. Even though, in total, even though your existing customers are staying with you at a much, much better rate, you're not attracting the new ones. So that's why the brand becomes so important. A company culture, very quickly, the reason that's important is you can say, hey, we're this great innovative com company, but in real life at the office, it's Dilbert, that's not going to last very long. I mean, that's not going to be the company you are. So what you say you are has got to resonate not only externally, but internally. It's got to be the way you behave and act. And last, I'm going to get the corporate social responsibility, because that, if anything, is the reason that you should want to be CEO of a big company someday. That's the positive side of power. It's the power to do good. And I would say that there is nothing you can do in this world today where you have the opportunity to do more good, the power to do more good, outside of maybe being the president of the United States or one of the G7, than if you're the CEO of a Fortune 50, Fortune 100 company. OK, so um, I probably should put my glasses on. I'm just embarrassed to have to wear them. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the, the customer experience, which was that second item. So the first thing we talked about, you saw some of the brand advertising, is the brand message. And I'll come back to that. The second is the customer experience. So as I mentioned, the kind of the bifurcation in customer sat. And it's only one, you know, but it is only a small piece of improving the strength of the brand because you're only talking to a small segment of the entire universe. But we've improved customer satisfaction now each and every month for 18 consecutive months. That's 18 months in a row going up. That's very hard to do, and that doesn't happen by accident. Every single Monday at every senior team meeting, which I lead, this is what we go through relentlessly in detail. What is it going to take to improve, uh, improve customer satin? FCR means first call resolution. Uh, when a customer calls in, Whatever their issue is, do you fix it the first time? Because that's a big driver of CSAT. Even if it takes longer, because it used to be our care centers were measured on hold time, how quickly they got the customer off the phone, rather than fixing the, the, the issue. So we, we don't even look at that anymore. We look at overall customer satisfaction and first call resolution. The other important thing in our business, we're a network business. How good is your network? And we've worked really, really hard on that. So pretty much across the board now, doesn't matter what study you look at, there's, there's really two networks that stand out. We're really competing for the top slot, and that's Sprint and Verizon. Generally, when it comes to data measurement, so your 3G network, Sprint wins. When it comes to your voice network, Verizon wins. But you know, those are the two networks that you're pretty much going to see at the top of almost all the ratings, then a gap to AT&T, then a gap to T-Mobile. So in terms of the, and it's important because you're going to see advertising claims out there, well, we're the fastest. 
you can, yeah, you probably are the fastest between three and four in the morning when all your iPhone users are sleeping. But the way networks work, it's just like a highway. It's, you know, you can have this big, great highway, but if too many people are on it, the experience is going to be much slower. It's going to be like the, the busy hour. So the speed limit becomes kind of irrelevant during the busy hour. So you have to take a lot of what you see in advertising with a grain of salt, because by the time they have to take that claim off the air, something else will pop up. But if you just look across the board at, at the, the ratings of the network, particularly 3G, um, the big company, we can't say who they are because you know, they, this is part of the deal. Everybody gets their reports. We all know, I know exactly what all of my competitors, how their networks work in every city and they know mine. Uh, we pay for those reports, but we're not allowed to talk about the company or what have you, but it is what gave us, the, you see of our, our advertising at the end of last year, we started message, messaging the most dependable 3G network. And this was the legal backing to do it. We felt very confident that we do have the most dependable 3G network. But it's been substantiated since then, time and time and time again. Here's three very recent studies, one from Gizmodo, um, also most dependable. PC World, about a month ago, picked us most reliable. Um, Boy Genius, just about, which is a, you know, a lot of you people probably know who these folks are if you're, if you're data oriented, if you're, if you're geeky at all, you know what, the, you know what all these things are, um, picked us as, uh, as fastest. So very important focusing on the quality of the network experience. This is what I was talking about earlier. So simply everything, the, the ad you see there on the right, I think is helpful in terms of just how simple we're making it. So for 100 bucks a month, yeah, you get unlimited voice, but you pay extra for everything else that's on our list you know, in the menu. So, you know, ours is like the unlimited buffet. Um, the others is more like a, you know, a Chinese menu where you pay a little extra for everything. And the difference would be if you're a typical iPhone user, smartphone user, what have you, you use your phone for a lot of things, for a lot of text and a lot of data, on average, you're going to spend $50 a month more on AT&T or on Verizon. So that you'll see that in the ad, say $1,200 over two years. Um, it's amazing, you know, the, it, well, it isn't really. You see the economic problem that the United States is in. You completely understand wireless advertising and why it works so, the way it does, where people focus on that phone price and they ignore the 24 easy payments of blank over, the, you know, over that two-year contract. So you're paying basically $1,200 extra for that iPhone. You're not spending $200. You're spending $1,400 over a comparative rate plan because people largely ignore all those later payments, just like they do on late night television, they just look at you know, how much cash you re are, you're required up front. The second item was, was ready now, which I talked about in terms of the retail experience. The most returned electronic advice, device of the last couple Christmas seasons has been the smartphone or PDA. And the reason is they're too complex. People get these things and you know, they do everything. You know, not only the, you know, their cameras, their camcorders, you can surf the web, they have GPS, they have all these things. You can watch television on them, but they're intimidating and they're complicated for kind of anybody over 25. So they're, they're returned a lot. And what, so what we have done in any of our stores is not only, you know, we come in, not only will we one-on-one -on -one teach you how to use the device, answer any question you have, but we'll set it up so you leave with it working exactly the way you want it. Your homepage will be set up exactly the way you want it if you want you know, I don't know how to pair a Bluetooth earbud with my phone. We'll pair that for you so it's all working on the way out. That very individualized attention. The reason we're moving that way is, you know, kind of to use the old Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, because he was saying, well, you know, why, you're not that fast a skater. Why are you always the first one to the puck? And he said, it's because I don't skate to the puck. I skate to where the puck is going. And that's fundamentally what we're doing in our industry. The world, our world, is moving toward data and moving toward what we call data, which is really non-voice, at an unbelievable pace. And that's why we're moving to 4G and why Sprint will build the first 4G network. We'll launch, I think, 17 significant cities this year uh, with 4G. Uh, and 4G, the generations, people say, well, what does the G stand for? 1G was analog, first generation. That was analog. 2G was digital. So when you hear acronyms like GSM or CDMA, that's digital. That meant you could send text messages or SMSs on, on your phone. And also you had a, a digital signal. 3G is what you know, the companies are out there pushing now. And it's broadband data on wireless services. And you'll hear 
acronyms like HSPA and EVDO and, and what have you, for those of you that pay attention to that. But that's 3G, and that's kind of the state of the art now. But 4G is now being built out. And 4G is, in each generation, basically is five times faster. Five times more efficient, five times faster. So we have 4G on the Sprint campus, on my mobile phone. I'll get an average download speed about six megs per second. That's flying. That's a cable modem on your phone. So 4G, and 3G is about five times faster than 2G. So that, it's about a half, of, a half an order of magnitude with each generation. That matters, especially when I get to what we call the MiFi uh, device and those kinds of devices that are, that are coming very soon. This is another thing that kind of shows where the puck is going. This shows of the phones that we sell, and this is really understated because it doesn't list in here air cards uh, or built in, you know, an air card is that, uh, you know, that thing you put in the side of your PC. That's not counted. Uh, or are things like MiFi devices, these would probably be, if I included that, about another 10 percentage points. So in Sprint's case, what is it, 62% of the phones we sell are really more data devices. They're what we call smartphones, QWERTY phones. Uh, the, what, what feature phones are really those that just have a 10 digit, you know, they have basically a number pad, something like the Razer, you know, the, the, the general phone. And over time, they're coming, they're coming down. So this is where the world is going. So now I'm gonna go back to the kind of the first pillar, which was brand message and communication. So you're really working hard on the network. And if you take a look at where the competitors are, are kind of positioning themselves, uh, you know, I have to give, you know, T-Mobile credit, they got Catherine Zeta-Jones. She's gonna get much better scores than me, that's for damn sure. Um, <laughs> but you can use her when your message is price. Uh, the reason I came off the air, I'm not running on the ads right now, is because our ads moved a bit more toward, we have kind of two ads, and I'll show you the other one, which is more around the Now Network. One was more around value. You don't want the CEO to be the one that's out there talking about price or value. I mean, you see him on TV all the time. You know, hey, this is Crazy Dan, come on down, I'll make the first 10 of a great deal. You know, whatever that is, that's not the, that's not the image you wanna, you wanna project for the CEO. So you don't have the CEO do the, do the price ads. But, you know, characters or actors, especially, uh, you know, someone like Catherine Zeta-Jones, who's actually seen as fairly, um, I don't know you say, um, highbrow or elegant, you, know, you, you, can, you can do something with that. So that's the main message there. In AT&T's case, it's an, it's an inanimate object. It's a device. It's, it's the iPhone. The other ads really don't resonate very much. They have this one where they have this um, kind of, if I can say the word, bitchy mother who's, you know, do you ever look at the kids' faces when they're, when they're listening to this girl? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. But those don't resonate all that well. But, they're, but the iPhone ads really do. And in the case of Verizon, and this is where I give Verizon a lot of credit. They've had, you know, the, the, the nerd with the, you know, with the glasses on their ads for years and years and years. And they've actually changed actors, but they look almost the same. And when you have that, the, the, the brand recall and message recall is very, very high. And it's all been about network dependability. So Verizon knows what they're doing. That's a, you know, that's a good ad. To me, it's a bit creepy because he's always got, you know, these zombies behind him. And they're like, everywhere you are, you get this nerd and these zombies. But at least <laughs> people, you know, people know what the, uh, what the ad stands for. And, it, and it's, really, it, it's really quite effective. But as we move into data and we move into this new world, we have this great asset. And where can we differentiate ourselves as Sprint, given this is where our, our competitors are? And around the network, if we have if you will, the best 3G network, and 3G is really for data, that's why you care about 3G, and we're gonna have the first 4G. How can we kind of bring that to life? Especially when our traditional brand messages uh, of you know, kind of a year, a uh, year and a half ago, uh, weren't, weren't working so well. So I'm gonna show the next clip here. On May 3rd, 2007, the Washington Post reported that Sprint's expensive marketing campaign has failed to mitigate its problems highlight any of its products and services, or otherwise distinguish its brand. Ouch. Well, there's only one thing to do. Get the brand back on track. The initial challenge was to make Sprint and its super fast network stand for something beyond the usual cell phone chatter about prices, drop calls, and rollover minutes. We worked on creating a single campaign. We began by renaming the network, the Now Network. 
Then we ask ourselves a simple question. What's going on right now? Welcome to the Now Network. Population 49 million. Right now, 23 million cell phone calls are being made. 380,000 people have just hung up. 1 million emails are in route. 7% of them contain the words Miracle Banana Diet. They're hitting 63,000 spam filters now. Twice as many people are searching for dog dog versus cat. I mean the talking boxer is being uploaded to YouTube from someone's phone now. Two million people are sending a text message during a business meeting. Most popular subject, diapers. 233,000 people just twittered on Twitter. 26% of the viewing this have no idea what that means. 6,000 people are researching restaurants in a cab. 29 of them just left their phone in that same cab. 13,000 people just landed and are switching on their phones. This is what's happening now. America's most dependable 3G network. Bringing you the first wireless 4G network. Sprint, the now. Online, we asked ourselves, what does now look like? And designed the world's largest widget. A one-page site of live feeds and data visualization. Everything is real. Live news feeds, blogs, live cams, Google searches, YouTube videos. We want partnerships and even let you be part of the site. You can add yourself, download music, make your own Twitter flock, and send e-cards that last only a moment. Online ads deliver more real-time data, like how many people are online right now, or the temperature of your team's ballpark. We use newspaper as a daily update, introducing new products, plans, and the insane value available to you on the Now Network. The new spring ads are not afraid to poke fun at the competition's expense. This one takes a chomp out of iPhone. And recently, we isolated the five best products that really bring the Now Network to life and ran full-page ads with competitive strengths detailed in photo captions. And recently, the campaign came to life in New York City, spectacularly taking over all the Reuters and NASDAQ boards in Times Square. Coming soon, look for now lounges and airports. An installation currently under construction features a full-size now widget and a free demonstration of my five. On the reverse side, you'll see the big five now products. This spot for NASCAR was recently finished. Welcome to Race Day on the Now Network. Right now, 7,100 people are listening to live race audio on NASCAR Spring Cup Mobile. The most commonly overheard phrase, 21 women just sent a text message from their phone to a giant video screen. And 17 people who saw their friend on television are calling that friend now. America's most dependable 3G network, bringing you the first and only wireless 4G network. Sprint, the now. More spots are rolling out for mobile broadband, MiFi, and back to school. A spot for the free goes head to head with iPhone on value while highlighting the multitasking capabilities of the Palm Web OS on the Now Network. The campaign launched in April, and the numbers are adding up. The total PR impressions across the entire campaign right now, over 50 million, with 183 articles written by 97 media outlets. Finally, Sprint's ad campaign just captured the top award in the world at the Cannes International Advertising Festival, a gold lion for best integrated campaign. Excellence in the integrated category requires an effort built on a single idea, flowing seamlessly across multiple media touch points, helping a brand grow stronger with each and every additional dimension. Sprint is now considered the world-class example of a best in green integrated campaign. So, um... I'll get to this in a sec, but the, uh, the Cannes Award was nice. It was, it was about uh, two months ago. There were 2,200 entries in the world as for the best campaign from, if you will, in all advertising anywhere in the world, 200 finalists, and we were picked number one. So that was, uh, it was, you know, it showed we were kind of on the right track. By the way, the widget, for those of you who uh, are interested, you know, go on our website. Um, it's addicting. Uh, you have it on your wallpaper or what have you, but you can basically tell what's going on on almost any subject anywhere in the world at, at even stuff you absolutely don't care about. 
you know, at, uh, at one time. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. So now let me move to the last uh, element of, of the brand, and that's corporate social responsibility, which I know is big at this university, as it should be. Um, you may have noticed uh, or, or seen the news uh, a little under a month ago when we launched uh, the, uh, the Reclaim phone, which is a real breakthrough. And we worked very closely with Samsung to develop this phone. I don't know how many of you saw the 60 Minutes uh, they did a thing on, you know, computers, phones, what happens to them. It's, there's a lot of nasty stuff in these electronic devices. And so we really want to do what we can to make them much more recyclable, much safer. So we came out with uh, the Reclaim. It's uh, made, you know, 80% from uh, recyclable materials. 40% uh, are biodegradable. That is made from corn plastic. So the plastic actually is made from corn. Uh, so it, you know... It doesn't take centuries to, if you will, degrade. It'll do it fairly quickly. Um, no PVCs. Uh, you know, Europe has these ROH, ROH um, standards, which basically mean no cadmium, no mercury. Mercury is a killer. You actually have to start being careful about eating fish anymore, which is really too bad uh, in, in, in this country. But none of that goes in the device at all. The packaging is 100% recyclable, and almost all of it is actually recycled itself. Um, you know, one of the downsides is to make it even more friendly, there's no user's manual. You've got to go online. Okay, so much less paper. The charger is, to, you know, it has to be pretty inter, uh, energy efficient to get the Energy Star. It's 12 times more efficient than you need to be to get the Energy Star. And it'll, the phone will tell you when it's fully charged. So it means it's going to unplug me because it's still going to trickle if you leave it in the wall um, at, you know, afterward. You know, on the phone, of course, it not only comes in green, it comes in this ocean blue, but, you know, the phone in terms of themes, the screen savers, you know, I got the picture of Earth, you've got all these really environmental themes, all the ringtones, animal sounds, uh, it's got this green tile you can go to and go to the Discovery Channel, um, other websites like All Things Green, all sorts of information associated with the environment. Uh, are on the phone. And, but most importantly, and I, and I have been researching this for a while, if you take a look at green products, people love to buy green products if they're great products, but they won't buy them just if they're green, if they're not as good as anything else out there. And this is the best $50 phone the company's ever introduced, even if it wasn't green at all, in terms of its feature set capability at this price point. It really, it, it really rocks. And for those of you who hang around, we're going to be raffling some off at the, uh, at the end. Um, so, are we uh, green enough, as we say, to, to, to be Irish? Because one, one of the things that I think appropriately is, uh, is an issue these days is something called greenwashing. Because green's a good thing to be. Are companies pretending to be green? Or is it really, so, so if you launch a phone like this, are you now green? Or is there something behind it? And it gets at that notion of the pillars and what a brand really is. What you say about your brand has to be who you really are, because it has an op the, the potential of backfiring if that's not the case. So, you know, are we really a green company? And I'll go through um, a few items here. We can tell I'm getting old. Even with glasses, this thing's hard to read. Um, so we were the, the first telecom carrier to be chosen by the EPA as a, a climate leader's partner. Um, largely because uh, we were the only telecom carrier who has actually established a greenhouse gas reduction target, 15% by, by 2017, which on a company our size and in our industry is, uh, is pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. Um, we're also by far the, the industry leader for phone recycling. You come into a Sprint store, we'll take your phone no matter what it is, who it came from, what brand is on it, or what have you. We, have more, we recycle three times the industry average in terms of phone recycling today. Uh, and actually, the money that we get from phone recycling, because a lot of phones, are, older ones, aren't worth anything. But, but some phones that are only a year, two years old, we might be able to either sell components or sell the phone. All of the proceeds from that goes to protecting the Internet for children. So it's all given away to charity. It's a very, very good uh, uh, program. Um, but we've also set a goal of 90% of phones recycled by, by 2017. So 90% of the phones that are sold in a year, we expect to recycle you know, 90% of that number each and every year. We're also the first carrier to establish environmental design criteria for devices and accessories. 
So one of the accessories that we're going to be raffling off with the winner of the Reclaim are solar chargers. Our, our cases now, we have cases that we're carrying made from recycled materials. Uh, so we're also going to have those go with the, with the Reclaim as well. So we're working very hard, and I'll talk about the influence that companies have when you think about the role of a CEO. Not only the role and influence you have on your own company, but you have an enormous amount of influence on your suppliers in terms of how they do business. You can require them to be green or greener if they do business um, with you. So we've established criteria for them. If you want to start selling us phones, you know, over time, these are the criteria that the devices have to meet. Uh, we're ranked of the 500 companies on the Fortune 500, ranked number 20 in terms of uh, the Green Power Partner List. Uh, we're the leader in the industry, actually, by far, in terms of use of renewable energy. Um, the Department of Energy, we're the, we're the only company to receive a, uh, a telecom company to receive a grant in the area of renewable energy. We have 12 patents in the area. Uh, the, um, what do they call it? The, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was, you know, the, the, the trillion dollars that got passed uh, a, a few months ago. But we won a, a grant for the development of hydrogen fuel cells. And they go to power our network. They're really they're, they're the battery backup. They're very clean. The only byproduct is heat and water. 80% um, of the, you know, we have this huge corporate campus, corporate headquarters uh, in Kansas City. 80% of the power for that campus is wind power. And that's not just because that's where all the executives are. But we have, uh, you know, a, a wind farm which we helped uh, fund that, uh, that powers the campus as well as, uh, you know, on the campus, you know, 80% is green space. And for watering that green space, we don't use any city water. It's either recycled or we get it from rain. Um, our future stores uh, and renovations will follow lead criteria. It's kind of like the good housekeeping seal, but there are criteria around uh, uses of materials as well as energy conservation. They're, the, you know, they're, they're really the, the specs for building, if you will, green buildings uh, going forward. And if you go into a Sprint store, there'll be a green area where you'll not only see um, green accessories, green devices, uh, a lot of things with that for people who are interested in the environment, whole product area there in our, in our stores. Uh, and we've committed to reduce our use of paper by 30% in, in five years. So which gets me to, you know, kind of the, my final uh, slide, which is why would you want to lead a large company? And the comment I made earlier, the, the education you're getting at Notre Dame, you know, kind of why you're here, uh, you know, the, your, your purpose. And there are lots and lots of great if you will, vocations. Uh, you can be a, a teacher, I mean, a, a parent, uh, the clergy, public service, public office. There are a lot of great vocations. I see business leadership as a vocation. Uh, that's the positive side of power. What I've provided are just some of the examples of the good one can do from leading a large company, not only doing the right things, um, but uh, you know, in terms of business results, but how, you know, how they're accomplished. And you not only influence the lives and livelihoods of, if you will, your employees, but also with your suppliers. If your business does well, your suppliers are going to do better. Um, but it's also how they're, how they're treated. I would recommend that a lot of you begin your career in sales. And the reason I say that really is twofold. One is I don't think there's any job where you learn the business better. And people ask me, you know, why, you know, what's the most important thing to being successful? Uh, and you know, number one is just working really hard, and number two is knowing your business really, really well. I've stayed in the same industry uh, for 32 years now. I've been in telecom. I can't imagine, and, and, I, and I feel like an idiot, and I'm learning and studying all the time. I carry no fewer than five cell phones, and I've got you know, stuff in there that's not released yet, you know, so all the, the new stuff before it goes out, I try it, I learn it, I know it. Um, but in sales, you have to know your product line, you have to know your competitors' products, you have to know your customer needs. Um, you learn your company, you learn it very well, and you learn your industry very well because you're right out there on the front line. The other thing you learn in sales when you're selling, you learn how to treat a salesman and how to treat a supplier. If there's anything that bothers me, um, it's, and, you, and you see it a lot, people treat their suppliers poorly, you know, they, they treat salespeople poorly, and it's tough when you're in that role. So that's, you know, that's another reason I think it's, it's, it's good to learn that. 
your customers, the quality of service. People now really depend upon their wireless phone. They depend upon the quality of the network. They de- they re- it does matter when you drop a call or you can't get on. So you do affect the quality of life, if you will, of your, uh, of your customers. Your shareholders, needless to say, if your stock goes up or down. Your communities. Uh, I, you know, I pride myself, and I can't take you know, much credit for this. Sprint has a long history of community service, but we're headquartered in Kansas City, and there is no company that even comes close in terms of our philanthropic activities in Kansas City, our employees being involved in the city, uh, and it, uh, in, you know, in addition to just the fact that your company's doing well, you know, our payroll in Kansas City is almost a billion dollars a year in terms of what we do for that community. So companies are extremely important to their, uh, to their communities and very importantly also the planet. What we do, what I was talking about from a you know, perspective of green. Now I'm going to finish here with the, uh, with the raffle. This is the new six pack as I was uh, calling it earlier. Uh, and I don't know how many of you, and you might, might have seen it in the ad, it was called the MiFi device. This is going to revolutionize wireless as we know it. What this is is a 3G data device and soon to come will be a dual mode 4G, 3G. So a 3G device operates at about one megabit per second in terms of data speeds. Think about a 4G device is roughly five times that fast and that's coming out this year. But what it has is it's it's a little Wi-Fi router as well. So anything you have that's Wi-Fi can also be connected to the internet anywhere you are, whether you take it in your car, put it in your pocket, put it in your you know, in your, in your backpack or what have you. So your PC, your MP3 player, your netbook, your camera, your camcorder, you name it, if it's Wi-Fi, or if you have one of those dang iPhones and you can't get the AT&T signal, which is normal, you can, <laughs> you can, surf, you can surf via this. So, uh, you know, the, the, the five beers could be five different devices. They could be five friends. You can just sit out on the, on the quad, but you can all be connected to the Internet. So now... Think about it with with what we call MiFi. The hotspot moves from the size of maybe a a building or a floor or maybe a coffee shop to the size of a city because the whole city is covered with 3G and then 4G. So imagine this, which is coming out soon in a lot of cities, with 4G speeds where you're operating five or six, and it doesn't matter. You don't have to be home. So a lot of people will cut the cord because you don't even need high-speed internet at home or in your apartment anymore, but the beauty is you can take it with you anywhere and all your devices are always connected. Uh, There are half a billion Wi-Fi enabled devices in America today and nothing is growing like like Wi-Fi. Almost all your medium and high-end phones are going to come with Wi-Fi capability uh, very soon. It's, It's growing at a very, very rapid rate and that's usually what takes a long time for a new standard to take hold. So when 2G moved to 3G, and when 1G moved to 2G, what took it a long time to really take off is you've got to wait for all those new 2G devices or new 3G devices. You don't have to wait for the 4G devices because if you've got Wi-Fi, it's already 4G. So that's going to be a big revolution that comes along in wireless. So um, I'm going to take some questions now, and then at the end, I'm going to do a little drawing for three reclaimed phones, and by the way, they uh, end... With the reclaimed phone, there'll be a solar charger and a um, kind of a, a green environmental carrying case. And two of these, two MiFi's, and all of them have unlimited service till January 31st included. So um, that's, that's so you guys don't bolt, by the way. That's, that's so you actually stay here. Um, so let me... Uh, there we go. So we'll get there.
back to our punt with no return as we go to Jimmy Roberts in New York for a sprint game break. <laughs> uh, we told you about this one at halftime. Here's the visual evidence. Notre Dame football is brought to you by Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> and only on the now Notre Dame football on NBC, presented by Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wonder how that happens, that we end up sponsoring Notre Dame football. Okay, what, uh, I'm sure there's some questions out there, and I'll, somebody will give me the high sign. Please, please come down to the microphones, time. we want everybody to hear your question. We have mics on both sides here, please come down to them. There's one up here. You didn't mention anything no. about Nextel. Well, um... Yeah. Nextel is part of Sprint. So we actually have lots of brands at Sprint. We have Boost. I know you've seen ads of, you know, about Boost, which is by, by far the most successful and fastest growing prepaid brand in the U.S. Actually, last quarter, we had the most new customers that any prepaid customer ever has in the U.S. Boost. We also have another brand we use called Nextel uh, because Sprint and Nextel merged back in 2005. Is there anything specifically about, because we are Sprint, um, you know, Nextel's not a separate outfit or company. It is a brand name that we use for devices that have the push-to-talk capability. We use the Nextel brand still because people know it. Well, actually, yes, correct. Uh, they do use two separate networks. Uh, the, the Nextel network uses a technology called IDEN. So in the, the company, in, that's where you really get the push-to-talk capability that, that comes on the IDEN network. That's, that's correct. So if you think of the, uh, the IDEN network, it's great for, it's very heavily skewed toward business customers, blue-collar construction, fleets and what have you because of all the applications with push-to-talk. It's also great for prepaid uh, services. So our Boost brand largely runs on the IDEN network. And then the CDMA network that I talked about in the 3G network is, um, is typically carries the Sprint brand associated with it. Parts of the network are together, but the air interface, the, if you will, the very last mile is separate between the IDEN network and the, and the CDMA network. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Ino Che. I'm a junior and marketing major. Um, I was wondering, like, how can you offer everything for $99 and still make money? Um, like, why won't your competitors do the same plan unless they're losing money by doing that. Yeah, um, and we make very, I mean, we make, we make money at 99, and part of it is how do you keep your, you know, how do you keep your costs low? Uh, and part of it has to do with, you know, with usage. So there is a limit. So uh, text is unlimited, voice is unlimited, but actually data is limited to five gigabytes, which is a lot. Okay, but if you start using more than that, you know, it's in the, it's in the print there, we can, we can kick you off or tell you to stop using so, so much. And that's the way we make sure that we can do it for $100. The big drivers in, uh, in profitability in the business are the most important thing is low churn. If a customer stays with you for a long period of time, uh, that's, that's the most important element of profitability. The second is average revenue per month. Because so many of the other costs, billing, customer care, um, even the, you know, the device, the subsidy on the device, uh, that um, yeah, there's more to contribute to it when a customer pays you more each month. But if they're in a, on a $99 plan and they have everything, if they have their data and their email and their text, they tend to churn at a much lower rate. They stay with you longer because it's a much bigger hassle to change carriers. Once I'm used to using Sprint TV and NFL Mobile Live and NASCAR Live and what have you. So in the economics, when we go to $100 a month, that was a crucial element of it. So it's actually a, a good, profitable product, and it's done very, very well. Um, I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I think the others possibly may, may come there, and we're ready if they do, but uh, so far they, they haven't. But it's really more about simplicity than, than, the, than, the, than the price point. Although the market is somewhat limited, people that will spend $100 a month or more, it still is a, it's still not a huge part of the market. Thank you. Yeah, good question. I can see he's a good business school student. How do you make money? That's, you know, the, yeah. Over the next 10 years or so, we'll probably see cell phones globally go from being luxury goods to being more commodities. 
network coverage will be good enough, uh, speed will be you know, good enough, and prices will probably be you know, good enough for people to afford. At that point, what, how do you think cell phone companies, or what actions do you think cell phone companies need to take to be able to differentiate themselves from each other? I think the opportunity to differentiate will become greater and greater and greater each year. So, um, especially as we move toward data and all of these other applications, uh, if you take a look at the difference in quality of networks, among voice, the difference between the number one and the number four network in terms of voice quality is very, very small. In data, it's huge. And then, then you have all these generations coming. So Sprint put in 2G two, three years ago, and now it's putting in 4G. AT&T and T-Mobile are just rolling out 3G, and so you've got much, much faster data speeds and all of these other applications. Then you have phones that are becoming Swiss Army knives with more and more functionality, and they're changing all the time. And actually, the biggest challenge we have right now in the industry is not how to differentiate. It's how can you um, have customers keep and be satisfied with their current phone longer and not want the newest and latest because it is so different than what was out only 12 months ago. So time is this enormous differentiator in terms of technological evolution. So the, you know, the camera we just announced, or the phone that we just announced today, um, which is going to be out in about a month, it's the third generation, what's called the Google phone, Android phone. The first one, you know, the first two generations in the US, actually I give T-Mobile credit for, they introduced the G1 and the one they have out now called the MyTouch. We waited for generation three because it's a big step forward. So this one, you have to wait another month to get it. But um, its capability, its processing power is mind-blowing. It's a five megapixel camera. It's got all these things that um, you know, will, will change. So I think, um, and with the business applications, et cetera, differentiation will not be an issue at all. The larger issue will be the one that was asked earlier. How can you make money? Um, because you're differentiating so much and so rapidly and changing so much in terms of what customers expect. By the end of, I think it's by the end of this year, it's expected that there will be 4 billion active cell phones in the world uh, and they're at a population of 6 billion people. It's the largest, fastest adoption of any technology in the history of mankind. It's one of $4 trillion industries in the world is wireless. Military, tourism, automobiles, and that's probably going to become under a billion at the, at the current, uh, or a trillion at the current uh, rate, and then you've got mobile. So uh, it, it, is a, it is an expanding uh, business, but technology and devices are changing so radically, and all these applications, like I talk about MiFi, it, um, differentiation is the last of our worries. All right, thank you. Good question, though. From a marketing yeah. standpoint, you guys obviously have a lot of, um, you're cheaper, you got a lot of uh, great network, a lot of great phones. From a marketing standpoint, how did you decide to focus the plan on the 3G network and not on the lower prices? That seems to be the focus of the past couple of years. And especially in this economic climate, you'd think that a cheaper price might, um, might be better. But this is obviously very successful. Yeah. Um, first of all, you can't own cheaper price. Anybody can always can go there just like that. Uh, and... Secondly, from a marketing perspective, it's, uh, it's not aspirational. And even if you notice Walmart, Walmart, when they just focused on cheap prices, they were getting their clocks cleaned by Target. And you'll it'll be interesting, you got the Target CEO coming up. And it moved to uh, maybe better prices live better. Uh, so there's a real and more brand oriented, higher end brands. So you can have value. So I think value is the secondary message. We talk about value and simplicity, but what's really important, what we believe customers want, is they want that great network experience. And so the challenge we have, and, and it is what we are trying to, trying to communicate, is to, is to communicate something we can own and really stand for over a long period of time, because you're investing in something over a long period of time. Verizon has done it, I think, the most successfully around voice quality. Can you hear me now? And the nerd, you know, all these years later, it's more or less, it's still the same thing. It's dead zones, but it's the same subject. Um, AT&T is one of those things where, you know, it's really not AT&T. It's SBC bought AT&T, took this great trusted brand, and, you know, is still using it. But it'll be interesting when they look, their, their success is really driven by 
someone else's brand. It's driven by Apple and their brand and the iPhone. And the good question is, what will be sustainable about AT&T once they lose the iPhone? And a lot of people are concerned because what that brand has historically stood for, which is great service, great network, uh, people have given AT&T the benefit of the doubt because of that for a long time. And finally, it's like, when is enough enough? And you're beginning to see articles, a lot of articles written about the network and what has happened to that, you know, uh, to that network. We believe by being first with 4G and always being in a lead will give us a, a better opportunity to get our value message across and have something that's different and sustainable. Uh, and of course, T-Mobile, and now you've got the disruptive carriers. That's the other thing you have, is how do you distinguish yourself from, you know, you've got prepaid coming in, so you have T-Mobile, and they're worth, again, you look at perception map, it's all about price. People know they're gonna drop calls, they know they're on a smaller network. Their 3G network is less than 1 20th the size of ours. Less than 1 20th. You know, so if you look, all those scores I saw, best 3G, most reliable 3G, there were only three G. There were only three three G networks evaluated in any in any of them. They don't bother to evaluate T Mobile's because they can't find a signal, and it's, it's true. It's true. They're not there, but they will eventually. But by the time T Mobile gets three G, we'll be on to four G. But they have positioned themselves also in that price area. When we started running value ads, I mentioned when I came off our advertising and we went out with value ads. When we did the research, and we do a lot of research on ads. A lot of people thought they were T-Mobile ads. Even though they said Sprint, because they were wireless and they were cheap, they immediately, so it actually helped T-Mobile. Because there was another, it's very true, so they own that. But where they will suffer is you've got Metro, I don't know if you're familiar with Metro PCS, Cricket, Leap, Boost, they're all coming in value. That's gonna become a very crowded world. The low capability, low price. It's not where we wanna be. So, okay, we have thanks. time for one more question. So you said Boost was actually owned by Sprint? Yes. Okay, um, in that case, I was wondering what um, the strategy was behind the complexity of the advertisement, considering the demographic that it seems to be targeted to. That's one portion of it. And then you mean, what you mean, do you... When you say the complexity of the advertisement? Yeah, because isn't it on something and then apostrophe D? And oh, unwronged? Unwronged, unscrewed, whatever it is. Um, I didn't get the message until I actually saw un and then a screw and then the D mm -hmm. because there would be things in between there. And so, and it seemed to be placed in lo locations where it was a lower targeted or a lower income targeted area, like subways, yes. trains, taxis, et cetera. Yes, that is absolutely true. And what are you doing to um, kind of combat the imitators who use the same black, green, and white messaging system? First thing I'll say about Boost is um, what made Boost a breakthrough in the industry is it was, and it gets back to simplicity, credibility, trust. $50 is $50. There are no extra fees. It's 50 bucks a month, unlimited. We're on Leap and Metro. They say whatever the price is, and there's all these extra fees. So that's where the unwronged and all that came from, as well as very high network quality. Uh, the ads and the business is is doing better than we had imagined in our wildest hopes. Again, I mentioned the last quarter, the best quarter in terms of new subscribers of any prepaid company in any quarter in US history. Okay, so it is just rocking right now. So, and it is aimed, prepaid does tend to, if you think of, of the postpaid market, postpaid market is what, you know, where you're billed each month, you sign a two year contract, you're required to have a certain credit score because again, people say, well, I bought the phone. No, you're putting a down payment on your phone and you're paying it off over two years. That iPhone's a $600, $700 device. Okay, these phones, they're $600, $700 devices. They're really expensive. That's what we pay for them when you buy them at a million a time. They're expensive. You buy a little because you agree, you know, buy them for a little because you agree for a long period of time. So because we're taking that kind of a risk, uh, you have to have a, a, a certain credit score to, to qualify for postpaid plan. Prepaid is for a huge segment of the U.S. market that, that doesn't carry a good credit rating, which is called subprime. As for prime, prepaid is for subprime. And it does tend to, uh, 
And by the way, it's increasingly over time, though, going to be going to expand to much more than that. It's for people that just don't want to enter contracts and want to have the flexibility of being able to move. You'll pay a lot more for your phone. So a phone that you would pay $50 for on postpaid, you'll pay $300 for prepaid, but you've got no contract. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. I can leave whenever I want. I really do. I really did buy that, that phone. So first of all, the ads tested very well. People got them very quickly. And by the way, we have both English language and particularly Hispanic. 40% uh, of our new customers are Hispanic. Um, we have you know, a lot of Hispanic advertising done extraordinarily well in, in, his, in Hispanic markets as well. Um, so based upon the, the target markets, the, the ads were researched, people got it right away, and it's working really well. And uh, we'll see what happens from an imitation point of view, but uh, we just hope it continues. Thanks. Is that it? I think we're okay. close. Oh, Before I, we have the drawing. Oh, I, I have the drawing, yeah. yeah. We have the drawing now, but I'd like to give you a small gift. This is oh, for thank your you. six packs this weekend. So. Oh, <laughs> terrific, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll start with the three reclaims, and with the reclaim comes a environmental carrying case and a solar charger. Oh, I'm going to need my glasses, aren't I? Okay, there we go. Drum roll, please. Okay, get out your coupons. Eight zero five zero seven two two. Like they, did they leave already? Oh, here we go, right here. And a green shirt, no less. All right. When you're at the end, you don't have to come now, but um, come down here and we'll have your, your phone for you. Jennifer will have it for you. Okay. Eight, zero, five, zero, eight, zero, seven. Right, the same, oh, one row up. Okay, we got a winner over here. Okay, keep going here. Eight, zero, five, zero, six, five, one. Up there? Okay. Right there. So those are the three phones. Now we have two MiFi's, that little device that'll, that 3G device <laughs> that connects five items. Okay, the first one, eight, zero, five, zero, five, six, <laughs> one. Right there. Right up there? Okay. Boy, we're, we're moving it around. Okay. Last one. Last one. Drum roll. Okay. Eight, zero, five, zero, eight, zero, eight. Right down here. Okay. Went all around the hoop. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.